Tony Crawford, actually, in the main. Um, I'm supporting the church leadership here. I'm a moderator. Also, uh, again, I've come along here in the last uh, 18 months now that I've been in Clacton, which is great. So it's wonderful to be here with you this morning. And again, on this solemn day, when it, it is Remembrance Sunday. So we remember all those who, whose lives have been affected by conflict, by war, and by uh, those who have served in the armed forces uh, and remembering those who are the heroes who did not return to the shores of Britain. So let's uh, begin with a, a call to worship. And my focus this morning is about peace. And that seems strange that when we talk on Remembrance Sunday, we're talking about those who have fought in a violent and bloody conflict. But for me, the focus is around peace and is around how the Lord, the Lord Jesus, wants us to live. So this is a few verses from the book of Philippians, and it says this. Join together in following my example. This is the Apostle Paul, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is in their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, our Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. My focus there is around the fact that we as Christians are citizens of heaven. So although effectively we are British citizens, although technically we are subjects of King Charles III, uh, we are citizens of heaven. And that citizenship is one that kind of supersedes our earthly one. Uh, that our focus and our sovereign ultimately is our Lord Jesus. We're going to sing a song which is I Vow to Thee My Country as our first song this morning. And you might think that's an interesting song to choose at the beginning of a remembrance service uh, because it does focus upon the difference between the service for our country, um, the United Kingdom, and also our focus of a heavenly kingdom that is yet to come and a heavenly kingdom that we will join um, when the Lord calls us home to heaven. But it is that kind of dualistic understanding that the Bible gives us, those two perspectives, that here on earth there will be those battles, there will be those difficulties, those problems, those things that we have to overcome as we struggle and seek to follow the Lord. But actually, ultimately, although we make that vow to be good citizens of our country, ultimately, we are heading to that heavenly city, that Zion, that city of God that is the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, and those are all kind of biblical images, pictures of a place of heaven that is populated by people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation under, on the earth. And there around that throne, again, the book of Revelation real, brings back the curtain. There, there is that worship of God and the worship of the Lamb who was slain. So let's stand and sing together. I thou, I vow to thee, my country, with the second half of this thinking, oh, please stand, uh, the second half of this about the fact of our heavenly, uh, our heavenly kingdom. Thank you.
Please be seated. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for that perspective that through the battles and difficulties of this life, Lord, you are with us and that you hold us and that we have that one Focus on our Lord Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, as we run this race with perseverance and want, Lord, again, to join that great crowd of witnesses in heaven, worshipping you and knowing that immensity of love that you have for us and how here on earth we share and can share with others that love that we have found in you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. I was going to talk to our young people, but they're all at the Cenotaph today, which is great. So now I'm going to talk to you guys. So I've got a few um, items here which are interesting. Anybody know what this is? A shell. Thank you. Anybody know what type of shell it is? I'm testing you now. A big one. <laughs> Correct answer. It's a big one, although they, they, they get a lot bigger than this, don't they? Some of them, they really do. This is a 16 and a half pound uh, artillery shell, and it says April 1918 on it. Um, and it also says Private G. Crawford, 94984, 15th Cheshire Regiment, Ballyou, which is in northern France. And that is my uncle, um, Isaac George. Um, and uh, Isaac George served in the 15th Chelsea Regiment at the Second Battle of Passchendaele in October 1917. I was privileged with my 18-year-old son, um, no, he was, no, he was actually 17 at the time, um, to go and stand on that battlefield a um, hundred years later uh, on the same day uh, that my uncle fought there in 2017 with my son, who would be two years younger than he was at 19, um, fighting there. And we uh, had a solemn moment and uh, a picture with my other brother as well, who was there, and remembered those brave soldiers that lived and fought and died there in northern France uh, around uh, that place. We also, amazingly, because it was a 100 years anniversary, we got to go in an underground bunker that was um, under, it actually under a church that had been completely decimated. The church had been rebuilt, but the bunker had been flooded, and so they hadn't used it. So they pumped it out because of the 100th anniversary, and we got to walk down into the actual underground. It was a deep bunker, so it was 20 feet, 25 feet underground. Um, so we had to go down these stairs, and to sit in the rooms of the soldiers that had been there, and there were still some of the, the bits of shells and other bits and bobs that had all obviously turned and rusted um, under the ground. And it was, a, again, it was a, an, a, a real sense of, wow, these soldiers were really in a horrendous and terrifying situation, um, bombarded by the artillery again and again and again. Uh, and my 19-year-old uncle, again, like so many other men, of, our, of that generation lived and thousands, hundreds of thousands of them sadly never returned to Britain. Um, so that again is the story of my uncle Private George Crawford. And each one of us I think has stories uh, in our families. I'm sure that there are in the First World War and the Second World War and then the subsequent conflicts. Again I was speaking to a, a worker uh, earlier on in the year who sadly uh, was involved in the uh, Gulf War and then through into the Iraq War. <coughs> Sorry. And he told me a, a very horrible story about having to fight his way into a camp on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, 2005. Um, and the horrific stories of how he had to release prisoners whose 
someone whose body parts have been nailed down to stop them escaping. So, yeah, not nice at all. Um, and that was the, the Iraq war that wasn't so, much, so far away. The scars that, again, those who fight in these wars have to carry around in their heads for generations and years. Let's just pause a minute uh, and we're going to pray. Then we're going to um, have a time of worship um, and reflect on those things. And I'm going to talk to you about this in a minute, okay? Um, and we will, again, think on. Father God, we thank you. And we remember just for a moment again all those who have been caught up and whose minds have been scarred by war and the violence and evil of war. And Father, we just pray now for the healing of those of people whose minds are damaged, that you, Lord Jesus, will help them, their emotions, their mental pathways, to find healing, to find peace, to find solace, and to know hope in their lives, Lord. Amen. Sing, my Jesus, my Saviour. Oh, is it? No, it is, sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Karen, back to notices. Yep, you're allowed. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Obviously, it looks a little depleted because we know it isn't just the girls' brigade who go down to the War Memorial, but there's quite a few members of our congregation who do that every year as well. So, uh, that's why it's looking a little low this morning um, and the girls brigade and um, the boys brigade that isn't running at the moment is probably represented there as well so this is good <clears throat> if any of your friends say later in the week couldn't get you online that's because we've still got an internet problem we are recording the service and it will be uploaded later so if anyone says anything to you uh, and for those of you that are watching it later, we're very sorry. Um, we will get on to our internet provider shortly. Okay. Now, um, this week, this week, Monday, we have a deacons meeting. Please pray for us as we meet together. And then on Wednesday, it's house group day this week. So those of you that meet here in the church at 9.45, that will be running. And the evening church meetings as well, 7.30 normally. But please check with your individual leader to make sure that that's running and that that's the time you're expected to attend. Now, next Sunday, uh, we have the... <coughs> sorry girls brigade the brigade enrollment service in the morning and in the afternoon we have a church uh, church members meeting now, i did mention this last week as well very important meeting uh, because there's two important things to do we have to say uh, yes to the church profile so that we can go ahead with our search for the minister and we also have uh, the election of deacons to do the, elect, the people who are being voted for this time because their term of office has come to an end and they've agreed to stand and have been proposed again are uh, Heather, Pauline and Elaine. And um, if you can't come to the meeting next Sunday afternoon, you are a church member and you want to vote, I have got some postal votes. I'm sorry I should have said that last week and I didn't. So much going on. But I have them with me. So if you wish to do one, then you, you do, to do a postal vote, then please come and get it from me today so that it can come back by next week and that will be fine. <coughs> Okay, uh, hopefully that's um, understood. Then we're going to have a bring and share tea together after the church meeting. So that will be a nice time of chatting and uh, fellowship with each other as well. Now, there's a, a few things for the future. Next Saturday's coffee morning is going to be in aid of children in need. Casey's probably down at the War Memorial where he'd be jumping up and down now, making sure we all know that <laughs> he's going to be making cakes for it. So please come and support that coffee morning. The following week's coffee morning, Girls' Brigade are taken. And also on that day, which is the 26th of November, the Christmas tree will be being put up in church and the Christmas decorations will be put in up as well because the 27th of November is the first Sunday in Advent. Oh my goodness, where's this year gone? <laughs> so, so that will be happening um, on the 26th of November. 
Okay, so please, I think Ian, did you want a few pairs of hands if people are wanting to help you? Yes, yeah, so if you can help with the putting up of the Christmas tree, let, just let Ian know and he'll tell you um, what time to arrive. And uh, I think we will have a few, but it'll be nice, always if more hands the better on that one, because it's quite big and it takes a while. So, okay, so I think that's the notices. Now, I don't have my helper to bring the... Um, the money box forward so is there anyone at the back there that would yeah please Trudy that would be lovely yeah anyone anyone at all <laughs> so that we can get, uh, offer the offering that's a funny thing to say isn't it <clears throat> you know what I mean it's when I run out of words <laughs> thanks Trudy if you just have to stand here and then you have to take it back with you when you go back <laughs> thank you um, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you give to us, everything you provide for us. Part of our thank you, Lord, is to give some of that, the money that we have or earn or have, it, have earned back to you. And we offer you this now, that which is in the boxes, that which is given direct into the bank in any other way. So we thank you for this and we offer you this, this to you now for your work, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And there's no children to go out, so all yours again. <laughs> it is. So, yeah, let's continue in our worship and we'll sing My Jesus, My Saviour. Thank you. If you're able, please do stand. <clears throat>
moments it'll be 11 o'clock and at 11 o'clock we're just going to pause and reflect for two minutes along with the rest of the nation I hope and reflect on all those again who've been caught up in conflicts around the world it's interesting that we wear the red poppy today after the first world war there was a period of time when lots of the widows wore white poppies And the reason they wore a white poppy was because they believed that the First World War was the Great War, the war to end all wars, and actually they wanted peace, and the white poppy was a symbol of peace. I've looked back over uh, a few years and looked at my family around the period of the First World War, and one of my family members, on their death certificate, this was a mum had the words war worry and my brother-in-law said that that was quite common in the 1920s and the 30s that women who had lost husbands sons in the first world war simply worried themselves to death and that was what the doctor put on their death certificate and so the consequences of war are immense And we think today about the fact that there is a European war again in Europe, in the Ukraine, and the horror and catastrophe that is faced by millions of Ukrainian people because of the invasion of Russia and the terror that they have faced in light of that. And that, sadly, is just one of many other incidents around our world, those that we know about, those that are more hidden, where men and women are forced 
and violated into situations of harm. And so we hold on and think for a few moments about that. This whistle has the words ARP on them, on it. Does anybody know what that means? Thank you very much. This was owned by my uncle, the same uncle that fought in, I think in the First World War, was an ARP warden in the Second World War. His, his brother also worked on radar for the RAF. So one of my other uncles was an RAF radar specialist, um, which of course was very important in the 1940s. He left his job and, and did that and served for five years uh, in the radar of the RAF. But this is an ARP, it's a warning that a bombing raid is about to come. My family originally come from um, South Cheshire and from Crewe, and in Crewe there was the big railway works which was quite heavily bombed, and so he would go and, and be part of the air raid wars around the, the Crewe works and the, also the Rolls-Royce uh, aircraft, uh, Rolls which was making aircraft engines at that point during the Second World War in, in Crewe. Um, and would sound this whistle. But this whistle also sounds very much like those whistles that the men who stood out and they said, you know, on the whistle, get out of the trenches, face the enemy. I'm going to think about that later, but I'm going to blow this whistle now at 11 o'clock and I want us to think again for these two minutes about the fact of all those who have heroically have given of themselves for the liberty and the freedom that we enjoy today and that that is a very precious thing, something that we should not uh, take for granted and we should hold on to and understand the joy of a balanced parliamentary democracy. Even though at times we don't like who's in charge, at least we have one. Um, and that we have the opportunity to decide who is in charge of our country, which is, again, uh, a positive and good thing. So let's pause a minute. I'm going to blow this whistle now at 11 o'clock and we will remember those who have given of themselves so wonderfully and so bravely and so courageously in the service of this nation for the liberty of people. Father God, we want to thank you again for the bravery and courage of those who have served and those who are affected by war and those who have fought for peace 
in our world. That you, Lord Jesus, would be near those today who are still in pain because of the difficulties that they have suffered, injuries both in the mind and in the body. That you, Lord, would be close to all of those soldiers, sailors, members of the armed services, and again, all those civilian populations who've also been caught into the horrors of war. Father, we long for peace on our planet Earth. That you, Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace, would reign and rule in peace. And the horrors of violence would no longer be part of our world. Father God, we do again pray for the people of the Ukraine and do ask again for peace in that nation. And Lord, we do also pray again for this fellowship, this church here, that you, Lord, would be near to all those who need that encouragement and blessing today. Again, we think of those who are affected in our family and need that healing and strength. For Sid in the care home, for Victoria's father who's recovering from hospital treatment. That you, Lord Jesus, would be with all those in our hearts and minds now who need that touch from you. And in a quiet moment, we lift all of those who we would like to see your encouragement and blessing in their lives. And we join together and pray the prayer that you taught us, Lord Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I think Anne is going to come up and read our Bible lesson. Thanks, Anne. The reading is from Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God, so that you can take your stand against the evil schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, Words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I'm going to stand again and sing All I Once Held Dear.
please be seated. So, I just want to think for a minute about the armed services and what it means, in a sense, for those who have joined the armed services. My uncle, as I say, was an 18-year-old young man in 19, late 1916, uh, early 1917, and he had the opportunity to go to university. He would have been the very first person in our family to go to university. However, the First World War arrived just at the wrong point. He'd even managed to win a scholarship to do that, because, of course, in, in that period, if you, <laughs> you, you had no money, you weren't going to go to university, no matter how bright you were. And the war came along, and he ended up joining, as I say, the 15th Cheshire Regiment. And I was thinking about the fact that for him, what was that like? There was obviously a great patriotic spirit there in the First World War, that people truly believed that the fight against the invasion and the uh, power of Germany uh, in the, um, the nations was something that was wrong, that they wanted to take over all of Europe and that the free nations needed to fight against that. And there was a strong patriotic spirit, uh, I think, in Britain, powerful at that point. And so he would have, obviously, as a young man, been kept that, um, and he would have gone along to the um, recruiting sergeant, and that would have probably been, again, for him uh, in, in Crewe in Cheshire, and there uh, he would have gone to the regimental uh, HQ, and there they would have said, right, let's give you a medical, and he'd got the medical, and then he would have been checked over, and now he was slightly shorter, so believe it or not, the, the uh, regiment, which was the 15th Cheshire Regiment, was known as the Bantam Regiment, because they were slightly smaller than the average soldiers, they were about 5 foot 2, 5 foot 3, uh, because you had to be about 5 foot 5, I think, to be in the army at that point, because, of course, it was the middle of the war, and they needed more soldiers, they reduced the height size, um, and he joined. And he would be asked at that point to sign his name. There in a nice little warm office in the middle of crew with his mates around him, cheering him on. Sign away, probably. And they did it in little groups, didn't they, uh, of comrades together. And he would have signed on. Then what happens? Well, then he gets his call-up papers. You will arrive at such a point and you will go to this barracks and you will then... Uh, head here. So then he does that. Then they would have been put on a train. Lots of them were at crew, of course, the train station. He jumps on a train, waves goodbye to the family that he loved, uh, and off he goes, probably into the south of England to a barracks, uh, uh, Aldershot or somewhere down there. From there, he then heads off uh, um, across um, to what was kind of a boat train thing, um, which wasn't in Dover, it was in Folkestone, I think. It was a further up and they would then go across from there, and he, sorry, would be trained uh, and everything else, all in England. So it would, it would all be in barracks and tents and what have you. Uh, and then they'd be stationed near and near the coast, go to um, northern France. Then they would get off the boat, they would all go through little places and towns, all the way to the front. And all of that training, all of that uh, equipment, and that decision he had made by signing his name when he is in that trench, it's pouring down with rain in the muddy Second Battle of Passchendaele in October 1917, when his, when his commanding officer stands up behind him and says, Right, lads! Made it! Fixed made it! On the wall! <coughs> Did he have an opportunity at that point to say, Ooh, this isn't a good idea. I have made a mistake here. I don't think I'm going to do what my commanding officer just told me to do. Do you think he said that, thought that? No. He was trained, one, that he did exactly what his commanding officer told him. There was no questioning. And the interesting thing, I think, for me as a Christian, part of my journey and, and movement into Christian faith was about the fact that when my commanding officer, the captain of the host, the Lord Jesus Christ, said, you know, do it. I signed my name away on it, uh, uh, in a sense, and was baptised and everything else. Then every day, the Lord Jesus blows that whistle for us, doesn't he? Right, today, new day, get out of the trench, 
Get up, move forward, advance against the enemy. The enemy being, again, the forces of darkness. So we're going to think about that verses that we read earlier, what is in them and how we can discern what God is saying to us. Because each day, our commanding officer blows that whistle. Every day, we get up and we work for Jesus. We fight for him in our lives and seek in our lives to be people who stand. Fighting to discern the deeper things here. Paul quickly says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against rulers, authorities, and powers of darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So all of that darkness that we experience here, that prejudice when people hate us for whatever reason or when people are pushing people away in terms of not helping and supporting them in ways that she's kind and generous and loving and supportive. There's so many things that impact our world, aren't they, in that way, that we as Christians have to make decisions every day to live for Jesus because we stand against the enemy. We stand against the forces of darkness that would seek to bring hate, injustice, bring oppression, bring... Uh, again, fear and division into our world. All of those forces are the forces of evil. And our fight is against them. And here, Paul says to us, when you've done all that, stand. And that's an interesting thought, isn't it? He's not asking us really to do things that are difficult. He's asking you to stand up for love for peace, for grace, for forgiveness, for hope, for joy, for kindness, for love. All of these things which have been part of our lives for so often. And it's interesting here that the Apostle Paul uses a military illustration by looking at the elements of armour that the Christian is to wear every day, put on that armour. Why? Because he wants us to be equipped. But Paul, in first century Christianity, uses that illustration, but he actually doesn't want us to be soldiers. And there is an interesting position for Christians at that point, because the soldier, his senior, ultimately was Caesar. And at the beginning of Romans, Paul very clearly says... Jesus is Lord. And the reason he says Jesus is Lord, and we say to each other, Jesus is Lord, we say it in a kind of a little bit of a little kind of, you know, ordinary way today, don't we? Oh, well, Jesus is Lord, that's great. And so we say it in a positive, really good way. The difficulty is for first century Christians, the Christians that Paul was writing to, every day, if they saw a Roman officer or a Roman official, they would say, Caesar is Lord. The greeting, they wouldn't say, hello, how are you doing? when they met people in the street, they would say, Caesar is Lord. That would be the de- the, their greeting because they wanted to express their, their, their agreement with the Roman Empire, all the things that were going on in Rome, everything else. They would say, Caesar is Lord. The difficulty is, of course, for Christians, could we say that? No. So joining the Roman army was a difficult thing for Christians. In fact, most people who became Christians left the Roman army because of that reason. Um, And for Paul, when he says, Jesus is Lord, that is in contradiction to the statement that was made by lots of Roman citizens of the time, which was always, Caesar is Lord. So the focus here for Paul is about the fact that that powers of evil and darkness, those that affected the Roman Empire, that affected the Caesars of the day, were powers of darkness the powers of the evil one, and that we were to stand firm. So, one of the things about where we are today and how we stand is that we live in a point whereby there are so many people that are stepping away from Christian faith and are deciding that the heritage of Christian faith isn't something they want to engage with anymore. 
One of the difficulties of our age is the fact that people no longer see Christian faith as something culturally that they would want to assign themselves to. Culturally, the Christian faith is seen often now as being old, irrelevant, no longer part of modern family Britain, like British life. And so when we stand and we show people God's love, and we say to people in a generous spirit, in a kind spirit, that actually we, we're doing what we do because we want to demonstrate that love that God has placed in our hearts. That simplicity is that statement against this world that says that Christianity is irrelevant now and the fact that actually we no longer have uh, to do the Christian thing which has been part of the culture of the nation. One of the um, neighbours that I see quite regularly, I was with him on Friday, because he knows that I'm a vicar, as he calls me, um, he always throws at me, whenever we talk about faith, so why is it that babies die? Why is it that bad things happen to good people? Why is it that there's so much suffering? Why is it that Russia has invaded the Ukraine and all the people there are being put in danger and killed? And I could explain to him in a deep theological way about the fall and about the entrance of evil into the world and about the fact that the world is not as God wants it to be and the fact that, again, God is bringing a new world into being. But actually, often as not, I'll say, I don't know. I cannot easily explain to you why evil exists in this world. Why, at the beginning, in that story from the beginning of of Genesis, evil entered the world, why that snake tempted Eve and then Adam, why that happened. All I know is it happened and that's part of the reality of our world and suffering and death is the tragedy of the human existence as God has given to it as of the minute, but that actually in Christ we have hope and we have a future. And we have to understand a little bit about who we are in the battle. We are people, we are Jesus' people. Um, I don't know how many of you have been along to any of these battle reenactments. I once went along to a battle reenactment of the civil, English Civil War. Um, and it was really interesting uh, because they had all these guys dressed up in their gear and they had these 20 foot pikes and they had these muskets, boom, 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 boom. And they had these firing bows and arrows and they had the Roman, uh, the Romans, <laughs> the royalists on one side and the parliamentarians on the other. And the royalists were. We stand for Charles and the sovereignty of the monarchy. And on the other side were the parliamentarians, and they, sh- and they shouted this, and I thought, oh, I never knew they did that. Our king, the only king we have is Jesus, shouted the parliamentarians. And that's a kind of an interesting thing, because, of course, in the Civil War, you had to choose between the king and parliament. There was no middle ground. Um, And that's the tragedy and nature of a civil war. But that they thought, and they believed, and they proclaimed that they were not gonna have a king because the only king they needed was Jesus. And it's an interesting thought again today that Jesus as the Prince of Peace is our king and that he ultimately is that king, our only king, ultimately. And what are we fighting for? Again, that sense of standing because we want to stand for truth. We want to stand for peace. We want to stand for wholeness and forgiveness. The the fullness of those fruits of the Spirit evidenced in our lives is so important. And that we stand again for Jesus. Paul at the end here says, pray on all occasions, all kinds of prayers and requests. Um... Sorry, and before that he says, have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So his first reference to the gospel here is that it is a gospel of peace, a reconciliation, a peace between man and God, a peace that we have to live out here on earth in our lives with other people. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And be alert, always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me 
that whenever I speak, words may be given me, that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. I love that thought uh, of both the mystery of the gospel and being an ambassador that is in chains. He was guarded when he wrote the, 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 this part of the gospel, um, this letter to the Ephesians, by a Roman soldier. So he had a Roman soldier sitting next to him most of the time. He knew quite well what it was like to be with a Roman soldier. But he said that it is a mystery. And I think what I want to hold out to us today is that the power of the gospel is that point in which Christ then gave up of himself to us. An act of love and self-surrender. Again, John's Gospel says uh, that, um, that the love required, again, the greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And that sense for Jesus that he laid down his life, the greatness of God's love for us was in Jesus laying down his life for us as his friends. And that there is a mystery to love. There is a mystery to how that love works within us, how that love is evidenced in our lives. But there is also a simplicity to it. Simplicity, again, of a love that's actions speak louder than our words. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but the, that, the neighbor that I just mentioned there um, has had a difficult period in his life. And... Um, I've got, I've, my, my set, the other car that we have is a, an old car, and I thought it'd be really nice if I can see how much it ins- to be to insure my car so that my neighbour could use it. So I looked at it, it was only 20 quid, so, because he's about the same age as me. So I went and had a chat with him, I said, you've got your driver's details? He said, why do you want my driver's details? And I said, well, you know, I think it'd be really good, um, you know, because, you, you, you know, you, 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 you'd already done some tinkering with my car as a favour, you could, might as well borrow my car. And so I said, I'll put you on the insurance, you can borrow my car. And he went, all right, okay. Um, and then the following week, I'd done it, I knocked on his door and I gave him my car keys. I said, you can use it over the weekends, I only use it for work. And then a big tear welled up in his eye. And I thought, oh, you're right. And he went, no one's ever done that for me. Let me use their car uh, for nothing. He said, do you not even want the 20 quid for your insurance? And I went, nah, it's not a worry. Um, and... He was really struck by just a little act of kindness, by a little act of love, a little bit of appreciation of him. And I think, again, what the Lord is after us is that gospel, that mystery of the gospel, which is about how we demonstrate the love of God, you know, in our world. For God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8 tells us. And so, back in that trench in the First World War, when the whistle is blown, as it is for us all every morning when we say hello to the Lord Jesus, when we make sure that decision that we have made to follow the Lord, that means that then our lives have to be different. We have to demonstrate that we are followers of Jesus by how we live, by the goodness of God in our lives and by the hope and the peace and the joy that should be the hallmarks of our lives so that others will know that when we stand, and again, we all stand in different ways, the uniqueness of Jesus will be seen in us and through us and touch other people. Let's pause and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for our Saviour Jesus. We thank you for the fact that he gave up his life for us in love because that love that God, the Father, the Son and the Spirit had for each one of us was such that they all suffered in the terror and horror of the cross. And we thank you, Lord, that in and through that, that you know, Lord, the bitterness of life and the difficulty of life 
and yet you stood and you worked through it and you came out the other side in the glorious resurrection, proving to us all hope and life through death and that awareness that we, again, can live for you each day knowing that you are with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn, which I think is God, Our Help in Ages Past. It is good. Let's stand and sing. May the Lord bless you today with his joy and his peace and may you know that hope that comes in the trust and knowledge of salvation and friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And they say the grace to each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Hopefully see you next Sunday. I'm going to throw in the fact that I might do a bit of a hot pot as well next Sunday for the church meeting. So there, I'll see you then. Bless you.